John chapter uh, 6, verse 60 through to 69, and then flip backwards to John chapter 3, from verse 1 through to verse 15. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. You can accept it. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he, has, he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the word of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. John 3, 1-15 Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miracles, signs you are, do you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can come to see to the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into the mother's, his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes, from where or where it goes, where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven. The Son of Man must, just as Moses, the Son of Man, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Born again. It's a term that's branded around a lot nowadays. And uh, anything from cars to detergents and even shoppings, uh, shops and things, that, you know, when they relaunch themselves, they say, this is now born again. It's something new that's come along. But where does this term originate from? Well, we heard in our reading from John chapter 3 that it was first said by Jesus. But before we get into today's message, I wanted to, us to do just a little bit of a, a background work to, when we say, set the scene. 
If you go back into John chapter 2, from verse 23 to 25, we read that many people saw the miraculous signs that Jesus was doing and believed. But Jesus wouldn't entrust himself to them, meaning that Jesus didn't trust these people because he knew people. He knew what their hearts were like. And as God incarnate, Jesus had this supernatural wisdom um, of, that he could see people's hearts and he could see people's minds. And really, the, all they were interested in was the entertainment value that Jesus was bringing along. You know, the miracles and the healings, it was all wow, wow, wow for them. And over time, many of these people fell away because they realized that Jesus wasn't about entertainment. But instead, as we read in John, as we heard in John chapter 6, that Jesus was about sacrifice. He was about service. You see, trust in Jesus is not just a, not merely a, a professing faith, but it's a possessing faith as well. It's a faith that we have to possess. And that's why Jesus wasn't entrusting himself to those crowds. But now we move into chapter 3. The scene moves from Jesus with all these crowds to an individual. Jesus and one man, Nicodemus. And he, here's Nicodemus. He's this, this Pharisee. And Pharisee meaning he was a part of an elect group of people that were, were separated from the rest of society. And he was also part of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling council. And these men were strict literalists, you know, when it came to the law. They held everyone down to the last dot on the I and the last crossing of the T and the full stop at the end. Literally, right down to the last letter. They were dedicated. They were zealous. They were self-denying. They were moral. But they were also self-righteous. They were heartless. They were hypocritical, you know. Do as I do, don't do as I, as you see me. Do as I say, don't do as I do, sort of thing. And these, these people, this Jewish ruling council, they were the main opponents of, of Jesus. And they were unsparing in his accusation, in their accusations of him. Of course, you know, that they could be, because Jesus wasn't a graduate of one of their schools. He wasn't a member of, of one of their orders. Jesus attacked their rules and their regulations, which by themselves, well, they had attacked, they had attached others to God's law, feeling them, themselves that important. But Nicodemus was different. He was the one who, at a later stage, stood up for Jesus when he was being, Jesus was being spoken of in the meetings that they had. He was the one who, when Jesus had died on the cross, had gone and bought myrrh and aloes out of his own money. About 35 kilograms of it. That wouldn't have been cheap. But, that's, but th this Nicodemus that we see here in John chapter 3 is the old Nicodemus. And he's coming to Jesus at night. And why night? Well, it's speculated that maybe he didn't want to be seen by others uh, that he was going to go and see Jesus. But Jewish history tells us that it was actually very normal for one rabbi to go visit another rabbi in the night. Because then they were less likely to be interrupted. They could have their deep theological discussions without the comings and goings of the, of the wife in and out and the kids running around and the cattle disrupting because they lived in the house as well, that sort of thing. But then we see in, in verse 2, Nicodemus recognizes Jesus' power, but not his deity. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher sent from God. Because nobody else could do the miraculous things you're doing by themselves. But do you notice what Jesus says? He doesn't respond to Nicodemus' statement. Instead, Jesus responds with a statement of his own, completely different to what Nicodemus had, had said. See, he knew Nicodemus' thoughts. Even before Nicodemus asks a question, Jesus gives him the answer. He says, I tell you the truth. Unless a man is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. But why did Jesus answer like this? Why? Was it to remove from Nicodemus' mind any sort of thought that he had had that maybe he could get into the kingdom of God by any other way other than the new birth? I mean, he was a Pharisee. He was born a Jew. He was a descendant of Abraham. He knew the law of Moses. He, he meticulously observed it. 
Surely that wouldn't go unnoticed by God and allow him a a free entry, you know. Some rabbis even taught that Abraham stood at the gates of hell to make sure that nobody slipped in by mistake. We know that's not true. But Paul said much the same thing about himself, didn't he? There in Philippians 3, verse 4 to 6, he says, If anyone thinks that he's got reason to put confidence in the flesh, I've got more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, well, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, well, I was persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. But then what does Paul say about all this heritage? But whatever was to my profit, I now consider it loss for the sake of Christ. And that's why Jesus says to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth. In spite of all that you think is necessary, all that you are and all that you do, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I think what Jesus says to Nicodemus that night shatters any hope that we have of ourselves, of of seeking salvation without being born again. Being born and raised in a Christian home, that's not going to save you. Being baptized as an infant, that's not going to save you. Attending church, well, that's not going to save you. Doing good works and helping people, that's not going to save you. Donating money to charities and to the Lord's work, that's not going to save you either. So if you've been looking at any of these to guarantee your ticket to heaven, you know, um, do not go to hell, bypass hell, go straight to heaven sort of thing, then listen again to what Jesus says. I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Unless. It's a necessity. It's a necessity. And this is our first point. That new birth is a necessity. You have to be born again. Or else we will never see, as Jesus says in verse 3, or enter the kingdom of heaven, as he says in verse 5. But Nicodemus questions this again. Maybe there's a hint of sarcasm because he he replies in a way facetiously, surely I can't enter my mother's womb a second time to be born again? What are you talking of? It's absolute rubbish. That word again, it's a Greek word, the Greek word anthonin. It's got three meanings to it. The first is from the first, from the beginning, or completely and fully. It's the same sentiment that Luke writes about in Luke chapter 1 verse 3 where he says he was investigating everything about Jesus from the very beginning. The word again, meaning a second time. You've done it again. Oh, you've done it a second time. It's what Paul says in Galatians 4 verse 9 when he writes, But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? The third meaning is from above, meaning from God. It's the same thing. It's the thing that Jesus says in John 19 verse 11 regarding Pilate and the power that is given to him. It's that power that has come from on high that was given to Pilate. And so when Jesus says that we are to be born again, we've got to be born completely again. And fully. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, he's what? He's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You've got to be born all over again in the sense of a second time. You've got to be born from above, from God. And when you're born from God, you become a child of God. John writes there in chap- back in chapter 1, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born by natural descent or by the will of a father or human decision, but by God. Paul writes of this new birth about being born again in Romans 6 verse 4 when he says that therefore we were buried, though we were buried with him through the baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. But even in the Old Testament, 
We've got the Lord speaking through Ezekiel, saying, I'm going to give them an undivided heart. I'm going to put a new spirit in them. I'm going to remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. How's that for being born again? The old stone heart being taken out and a new heart of flesh being given. And right through the, right through the New Testament, we've got this idea of being born again, of a rebirth or a recreation. Peter speaks of being born anew by God's great mercy and being born anew from an imperishable seed, a seed that lasts. James speaks of God bringing us forth by the word of truth. And Paul speaks of it time and time again in various ways and various formats. He says that it's by the washing of regeneration, by dying with Jesus and rising to new life. And as believers in Christ, we are born as new babes in Christ and being a new creation in Jesus. What wonderful words. But this new life, this new birth that is offered to us. But this new birth is spiritual. And this is our second point. It's a spiritual birth because it comes from above. And with this, this new birth experience that Jesus said to Nicodemus that he had to experience himself, it wasn't from an earthly origin because it only comes from God. It's only of God. It's only from him. And 1 Peter 2, chapter 1, verse 3 says as much. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He's given us new birth. Into what? Into a living hope. A living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And because it's, it's from God, and it is of God, we can't make ourselves born again. You know, we, just like we can't make our own physical births, because we have no part in our own births. We have no say in our own birth. And so our spiritual birth comes from God and from Him alone. There's nothing we can do. This new birth of being born again, it isn't a reworking of our original selves. It's not a revamp. As Paul writes in Romans 6, 6, he says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, so that we're no longer a slave to sin. It's not a regeneration. It's a renewal. It's a completely brand new. It's where our old self is crucified, where it's killed off, and an actual creation happens. A new birth happens within us spiritually. Our old self? What happens to that? Well, that old self that's been corrupted by its deepful, uh, deceitful desires, it gets discarded. And the new birth is made new in the attitude of our minds. We put on this new self. We're created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's what Paul writes in Ephesians 4. And so the words of, of Nicodemus, how can I be born, or how can a man be born when he's old? shows his thinking. He's thinking of a natural thing. He's not understanding that Jesus is talking about a spiritual birth that has to happen. And then Jesus answers him, not from a physical world, or a physical point of view, but from a spiritual point of view. Just like he did when those Pharisees came up to him and, and Jesus says, well, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. Was he talking about that physical temple that was standing there? No. He was talking about himself. Destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. Jesus goes on to talking with Nicodemus about the things of the flesh and the things of the spirit. And that's our third point. Because new birth is born not only of the flesh, but also of the spirit. Again, Jesus addresses Nicodemus, as Nicodemus with the words, I tell you the truth. Have you noticed in that passage he says it to him three times? And he comes to, Jesus says to him, I tell you the truth. Why? Because Jesus is the truth. And it's his truth that will set us free. Someone once said, truth is not defined by our own subjective standards. It's determined by the source of truth himself. 
Not the source of truth itself, but the source of truth himself, Jesus Christ. And truth, well, let's look at the Greek word. See if I can pronounce it correctly. Aletheia. Okay. Um, A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A. With a, on the first E. Aletheia. And what does it mean? It means reality. The opposite of illusion. It's a fact. And so when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, what is he saying to Nicodemus? Don't listen to what the world tells you. Don't listen to what the world tells you. Listen to me, because I'm the one who's speaking the truth. I'm the one who's speaking reality. I'm the one who is speaking the fact. The world doesn't. The world talks holes in your head. I speak the truth. And then Jesus says these words about being born not only of water, but of the Spirit as well. Born of water and born of flesh, well, that gives an idea of our physical birth. You now, while we're in the womb, we're enveloped in this, this sack of amniotic fluid. And then the waters break and the birthing process begins. The flesh, the mother, gives birth to flesh, the child. But Jesus adds that despite this physical birth that each and every one of us has to go through, which is necessary for physical life, there has to be a spiritual birth as well. The birth of the spirit of man. Paul tells us in Romans 8 verse 6 that the mind of, of, is governed by the flesh. The mind that is governed by flesh is what? It's death. But the mind that's governed by the spirit is life and peace. The Spirit of God brings life and peace. And our our sinful spirits are dead until they're rebirthed in and through Christ. And this death, when did it happen? Well, way back there in the Garden of Eden. That moment that Adam and Eve, who, when they were deceived by that serpent, ate that forbidden fruit. And from that moment on, mankind's spirit was born dead. Up till then, it was alive. It was, they were walking with God there in the garden. They had communion with Him. They had a relationship with Him. And no matter how hard we try on our own, we can never rebirth our spirit so that it is acceptable before God. No matter what we do. See, only Jesus can do it. Only He can do it through His Holy Spirit. Because He's the one who calls us into a relationship with Himself. You know, we don't walk around looking for God. He finds us. Now, God's not lost. Jesus isn't hiding. We're the ones that are found by him. As, as, as he says, in, in, Jesus says in Luke 15, that he finds us and brings us into his fold. It's all the work of the Holy Spirit. All that we do is respond to that call. The Holy Spirit then rebirths us. He rebirths our spirit so that we become sons and daughters of God. As John has written there in chapter 1, verse 12, he says, Yet to all who have received him, all who have received Jesus, to those who believed in Jesus' name, God gave the right to become children of God. And Paul writes in Romans 8, 14, Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are what? Sons of God. So if we're led by the Spirit of God, we are sons and daughters of God. And we don't, and, you know, just like we, we don't understand the wind. Rebecca and I were talking about it the other day. As we were driving along, we were coming back from Joburg last Sunday, it was very windy. And she said, what is wind? You can't see it. You can't touch it. But you can feel it. You can hear it. And so Jesus says, well, you don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going to. And so it's being born of the Spirit. It, it's something that our, our finite minds cannot comprehend. We can't grasp it. But we've got to accept it by faith. It's that same faith that Abraham had when God told him, right, you pack up everything and I'm going to show you where to go. Oh, sure, God. Let me, uh, let me just consult with everybody first and give me the itinerary and the direction, the route markers and everything, and then I'll get back to you. Oh. It was by faith that Abraham set out. By faith. 
He just packed up everything and he said, Lord, I'm following you. That same sort of faith. Our final point is that new birth is a true experience. It's a true experience. Nicodemus asks, well, how can this be? How can this be? And Jesus responds, well, you're a respected teacher, a Jewish teacher, and you don't understand these things? You don't understand about being born again? How stupid are you? Because it, it was highly unlikely that Nicodemus didn't understand. Because Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15 about how from infancy Timothy had known the Holy Scriptures. And the Holy Scriptures back then was the Tanakh. You know, it was this, it consisted of the Torah, the, the Nevaim, and the Ketuvim. Those three sections were together and that was the Tanakh. Our Old Testament that we have today. And Timothy knew these scriptures. So surely Nicodemus would have known them as well. A respected teacher. Somebody who had gone through the system. You see, all these, these parts of scripture that they had all pointed to salvation as a gift to those who humbly and by faith sought redemption from their sins. Isaiah wrote these words of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16 to 18. It says, take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they are going to be like wool. What clearer words of salvation can you find? And that's in the Old Testament. So Nicodemus had no excuse. And as a scholar and a teacher of these, of the, of these scriptures, Nicodemus would have known this. He could have experienced this himself. Because new, dearth, new birth is a definite experience. It's a real experience. You, know, you don't just wake up one morning and, and suddenly think that you've been reborn. It's something that you have to consciously experience because it's real and it's true. How do we experience this new birth? 1 John 5 verse 1 tells us that we have to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 1 Corinthians 4.15 that through the gospel of Jesus Christ as it's shared, we come to believe and we come to experience this new birth. And as Peter writes in 1 Peter 1.23, we come to experience this new birth by the Word of God. So what does this new birth accomplish? Well, it brings about a changed life. A totally new life. And the person who is born again, as Jesus says we should be, how, what are we going to show? What are, what are the, the things that come out of us that people can see that this has happened? We start doing righteous acts. We stop practicing sin. We start loving other believers. We overcome the world. And we keep ourselves from sin. You can read about those in 1 John, John's first letter. And so this brings me to the conclusion. New birth is necessary. New birth is spiritual. New birth is of the water and of the Spirit. And new birth is a true experience. Jesus says to Nicodemus, and he says to all of us there in verse 11, I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen. But still you people don't accept our testimony. We've heard the truth. You've heard the truth. Do you accept Christ's testimony? Do you accept his offer of new birth? Look to the cross. See Jesus lifted up and receive that gift of new birth, that eternal life that he offers to each and every one of us. It's there for all who will believe. Let's pray.
Precious Father, as we, we look in the world today, the things that are happening, especially there in the, in the Middle East, Father, with your, your nation, the attacks that are happening to it, the people that are rising up against them. All we can see, Lord Jesus, is that time is getting close. Time is getting short to your return. And Heavenly Father, we know that the only way that we will be saved from it all, the only way that we will be rescued from it, the only way that we will be able to spend eternity with you is through new birth. Not through anything that we do, not through any program that we follow or any, whatever it is, Father, anything that we do on our own. But it's a new birth that you call us to. And that new birth, Father, it's necessary. That new birth, Father, is, it's a spiritual birth that happens within us. It's a birth that happens, yes, we're born physically, but it's a birth that happens to us spiritually through your Spirit, your Spirit that comes and lives within us, that changes us from the inside out. It's a new birth that, that we can experience because it is a true experience that comes from you. It's not a temporary fleeting thing, but it's an experience that we, we live each day knowing that we are children of the Most High God knowing that you love us, knowing that you sent your Son to die for us, knowing that through his death on the cross our sins are forgiven, knowing that through his rising from the dead that we have eternal life because death has been defeated, knowing that through Jesus' ascension back to the right, your right hand, that Father, he will come again to, to collect those who love him, to take them with him back to heaven. And we look forward to that day. We look forward to that day when we will be with the multitudes of believers, those who, call, who are called by the name of God, as sons and daughters of God who have experienced this new birth, to stand before the throne and to sing praises and to sing glory and to sing hosanna to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So, Father, we've heard your word this morning. My prayer is, Father, that we would go out from here knowing exactly where we stand with you. That there wouldn't be a doubt within us that we are children of the Most High God. So we give you thanks, Father. We give you thanks, Son. And we give you thanks, Holy Spirit. Amen.